If you love me, Jesus says, follow me. The Apostle John, who wrote the letter of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Book of Revelation, plus the Gospel of John that we're reading at the moment, I think we're up to chapter 9. Now, when he wrote 1 John, um, the letter, and, and Pastor Cash commenced the series on If You Love Me last week, and that was a cracker of a message. I watched it on YouTube or our CFC channel. Do you watch it? So when I'm away, I don't miss church. I wish I could get the music as well, but we can't do that legally. So, uh, but that was a great message. If you missed last week's, you need just to download it and listen to it. It was a, a powerful word. And so I'm doing number two. But John, who wrote this letter, uh, he was an old follower by now. He was not a young bloke. In fact, he's writing at around 90 AD, probably 85, 90 AD. They know it's around the time of the Emperor Domitian, who was a crackpot, a uh, nasty piece of work. Um, and so the book of Revelation was written around that time. And so we're talking about 60 years after the death and resurrection and ascension events. And so John was there as a young man. So now he's an old boy. So he's been an eyewitness of it all. He knew Jesus well. In fact, tradition tells us that his mum, Salome, was um, uh, Mary, Jesus' mother's sister. And so can't verify that from Scripture, but um, if that's true, then obviously he was a family member and connected uh, with Jesus. So he knows what following Jesus entails. And in chapter 2 of his challenging um, letter, he makes some statements um, uh, in chapter 2 that really are in your face. They are very, very strong statements. Uh, John is the apostle or disciple of love, but actually his nickname was Son of Thunder. And the reason why he was called a Son of Thunder like James is because he used to shoot his mouth off and he was very direct. So he didn't mess with John. We tend to think of him as a lovey-dovey kind of guy, but actually he was a real straight shooter. And uh, Jesus a couple of times had to correct him and his brother James because they were speaking without thinking and saying some things that weren't very nice <laughs> and uh, but he learned love and he understood love and he watched love in action in Jesus and it melted his heart and as an old boy now he's writing some things but he's still pretty straight he's in your face <laughs> and um, uh, and maybe some of the things that the points he makes you might think whoa that's pretty strong but that's what John is like and he helps us to see and understand who Jesus really is and what's required in following him and we choose to follow Jesus because of who he is he is God's son the God man who visited the planet we choose to follow Jesus because of what he did for us on a cross and we choose to follow Jesus because of what he continues to do for us from heaven and folks sin is a really big issue with God it's a really big issue with God. You read from Genesis right through to Revelation. It's a huge issue and it cannot be dismissed that human beings who are made in his image with all the potential in the world to love each other and to live in harmony and peace chose to reject him and go their own way and that alienation from him caused separation among people and you have all this independence, so sin put the big eye is independence of God and out of that flows all the sins the bad attitudes and bad behaviors that we see in our world today and have seen throughout human history and so sin has to be punished sin has to be dealt with um, God had to find a way by which his own sense of justice could be appeased and his love found a way by which we could be forgiven of all of our sins and be reconciled to a perfect God, even though we're imperfect. And uh, people say, well, you know, why all the rigmarole with shedding of blood and, you know, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament and then Jesus? It's because sin is a really big issue. God cannot look upon sin. And uh, he, he detests when people do the wrong thing. He, he, he hurts, he cries, he grieves. You think of the shock that, that we received just what, last week. I mean, how does a government that's supposedly supposed to care for its people send sarin gas to kill a whole bunch of kids, babies? Like, uh, that's like, wow, that's really evil, isn't it? 
It's like, yeah, and I've just read on, on Twitter that uh, the Americans are now sending a battle fleet to North Korea. Aircraft carrier destroyers, all going there right now. Who knows what the heck's going to happen? Because you've got a crazy man in North Korea who's shooting rockets over to Japan. And he's saying, man, I said, I'll get a ballistic missile going, I'll get a nuclear warhead, we'll hit the Californian coast. As if the United States will allow that. You know, like as if that's going to happen. It's like, you think, how do people get to that point where you're making those threats? How do you kill innocent babies? It's evil of a scale that, that is just horrendous. And so that's the ultimate independence of God. I become a God and I can do what I want when I want. And if good men and good nations don't do anything, we would all be doing the Nazi salute today. Or we'd be saying, how Lenin today. And so uh, evil is around, and, and in the 20th century particularly, we saw unbelievable evil. Uh, as ISIS is in their death throes now in Iraq and, and uh, Syria, they're just killing people. Like groups of 20, 30, just like that. Christians, Yazidis, uh, their own Muslim people, any, any Muslim, Sunni Muslim who doesn't follow, they're dead too. They're just like, well, how do you get to that point? So that shocks us, because we don't see that in Australia. We are such a blessed country but it's very real out there in our world so sin is a really big issue how does God bring forgiveness and reconciliation to restore lost sinful humanity to him and he remained perfectly just well his love his love found a way somebody had to pay the punishment for all the sins past present and future and that was his own son the father the son the holy spirit they chose and so he became a man and and died in our place and you might say well why did he just why did he have to do that why did he just go shucks boys will be boys girls will be girls and and let's just start again let's just forgive them all that would be as foolish as as if our prime minister and, and all the state premiers and all the parliament said tomorrow morning you know what we really feel very benevolent today we just want to be merciful so we're going to suspend all the laws in australia national and state for the next month and we're going to let out every person that's committed a crime from all the prisons how would you feel you go whoa no way i'm a law-abiding person we have governance we have societal laws we have we can't let the pedophiles and the rapists and the murderers and the thieves out to run amok we all know there has to be a sense of justice and if that's not as imperfect as it is and if that's not outwork we chaos would result and our universe would be chaotic if God was not just. And uh, so God is perfectly just. And so we deserved to be condemned to hell forever and ever for our sins. But his love found a way by which his justice could be appeased and for us to be forgiven. And that was his son took the rap for us. All the sins, past, present and future. And when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment... The sins of the world came upon him. Matthew said, didn't he? John the Baptist said, here, his name, you call, it, you call him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. The father turned his back because the father cannot look upon sin. So he became sin for us so that we could be made righteous before God. So when God looks at us now, he doesn't see our sins, our past sins or our present sins, the ones that we've committed even this week or our future sins. If we put our trust in Jesus... Our sin is covered by his shed blood. And so we are now made right with God because he now is not angry towards us. He's not angry. His, his anger burned on Mount Calvary where the sin of the world came upon, upon Jesus. So he does not want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. And so he gives them the opportunity to say, come and believe and, and be saved call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved and forgiven and given the gift of eternal life now John in bridging chapter 1 and chapter 2 he makes these these wonderful words 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 through to 1 John 2 2 listen to these words it's a natural bridge between the two chapters and then it leads us on to say why he says now if this is true this is why we follow him if we claim to be without sin John says in 1 John 1 8 it's not on the screen if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us so if anyone here says look I'm not a sinner well you've deceived yourself and the truth is not in you 
We're all sin. We're all imperfect. We're all sin. We're all imperfect. We all fall short of the ideal that God has for us. But if we confess our sins, in other words, we, we, we own up to them and we bring them out in the open to God and to ourselves, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and He will purify us from unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. My dear children, this is John now as an old man, go, come on kids, my spiritual kids, my babies, because I write this to you so that you will not sin. So it's not impossible for a Christian to sin, but it is possible for a Christian not to sin. Does that make sense? It's Socratic kind of logic. It's not impossible for a Christian to sin, but it is possible for a Christian not to sin. I write this to you that you will not sin. So, so imagine, so as I'm, I'm an older man, I'm a 53-year-old man, okay? And I'm walking... <laughs> who's just told a big lie. So when I walk, I don't fall over very often because I watch where I'm going. And, you know, when you hit 60, this is a secret, you actually watch more carefully how you walk. And you make sure your shoes are wide enough that they don't slip. And when you walk downstairs, you actually do hold the, the rail there. But you guys that are under 60, you, don't, you say, well, that's not going to happen. And one day you wake up and you think, gee, it's hard to get in and out of this car. What's happened? It just hits you one day, doesn't it? Like, what has gone on? So, it's very rare. So, it's possible for me not to sin, to not to fall over. But it's not impossible for me. Because if I'm careless and, like, not watching what's there, I can go for a, for a sixer. And I have in the last few years. I went for a beauty. And uh, I tell you, but babies when they're learning to walk they fall over all the time okay that's just part of, of learning how to walk and so when we become Christians we do trip over a fair bit and we and so our good heavenly father doesn't whack us on the head and go you should be running like a 50 year old he says no 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 come on son up you get a little kid and and you encourage them and they they get stronger and stronger so so we it's possible for us not to sin we don't believe in sinless perfection. In other words, because you can fall and you can make a mistake and you can choose to do the wrong thing. But our heart is that we want to do what's right. So, so John says here, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, in other words, if you've sinned, we have a defense attorney with the Father, a spiritual defense attorney. And he's always speaking to the Father, saying, Father, my blood was shed and it covers Philip's sin. It covers... Laura's sin, it covers Bill's sin, past, present and future. If we come to the Father through Jesus, what happened 2,000 years ago, the shed blood of Christ is effective to cover all your sin, past, present and future. And John says, my dear children, I write this so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Atoning sacrifice, big concept. Sacrifice, we understand, atoning means in our place. Break it up, at one meant, through his death on the cross, God bridge, it's a bridge between a perfect God and imperfect humanity, sinless God, sinful humanity. At one moment, through the shed blood of Christ, we're brought together. That's why he's our substitute, it should have been us. He is the atoning sacrifice for your sins, not only yours, but also the sins of the whole world. Can you say amen to that? Isn't it good to be forgiven and to know you're forgiven? And God's not, God doesn't look at our sins, He looks at Christ within. And He wants us to keep looking to Him. We hurt ourselves when we, if we're believers and we're walking with Him, we hurt ourselves when we sin and we go, oh Lord, I just, I shouldn't be tripping up in this area now. Help me. He doesn't condemn us. So He deals with the penalty of sin, the guilt of sin, but He also deals with the power of sin, what drives us to keep doing it. And one day He's going to remove us from the very presence of sin. When Christ returns, it covers the totality, past, present and future. Now, we follow Jesus in this life because of this. So what does following Jesus look like in everyday life? Well, John, as I was reading 1 John 2, certain things hit me. 
certain fragments of verses or whole verses, and, and, um, and he says this, Jesus, and I'm saying this, if Jesus was here, because John is saying, I know Jesus, and I've walked with him, and Jesus says to us, walk as I walk. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as... Next slide, guys. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. How's that? What a statement. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So Jesus says to us, walk as I walk. So let me succinctly state how Jesus walked. Do you know how he walked? He walked wholeheartedly obeying his Father in heaven. Wholeheartedly obeying his Father in heaven. And he walked by trusting in his Father's word, even in the most difficult and impossible situations. Folks, it's the same for us as the old hymn writer penned so long ago. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. We obey his commands, even the ones that are really inconvenient and the ones that challenge our willfulness. Will it be my way or will it be Jesus' way? Remember the Lord's Prayer? We love the second half of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, I need help, Lord. Financial, material, physical help. I need... Oh, Lord, I need, I need your help in my relationships. You know, uh, help me to be forgiving. You know, forgive me my trespass, even as I've forgiven those who trespassed against me. Oh, I need help in my relationships. I need forgiving power. I need grace. Or oh, the enemy's given me an a, a attack. I need to resist temptation and overcome the enemy. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we love that second part because it covers all our physical, material, financial needs. It covers our psychological, relational needs. It covers our spiritual needs. But the first half is most important. The Lord's Prayer says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what he's saying is? It's not about your name. It's not about lifting your name up. It's not about building your kingdom. It's not about doing your will. To be a follower involves honouring his name in everything we think, say and do. It is advancing his interests, his kingdom, not building my own kingdom. It's doing his will, not doing my will. And so the scripture, you can divide the scriptures up into either commands that need to be obeyed or promises that need to be believed. And so these commands need to be obeyed. And some of them are really inconvenient. They're in your face. You read them and go, that's a really hard saying. It's like a mirror and you go, whoa, you see your sin. You see your selfishness. You think, oh, Lord, that's a really hard thing to do. What? I'm enjoying being selfish and greedy and lustful at the moment. And he says, no, 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 it's wrong. Son, there's a better way. Ooh. And that's why there's some people when they read, when they heard him, they go, that's just too hard. I'm walking. And they walked away. They believed they walked away because it was too hard. We don't preach a convenient Jesus. We don't preach a saccharine Christ. We don't say he's a gentle little pussycat that just purrs for you. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he can roar. He's wild, but he's good. And merciful. We don't accept him on our terms. We surrender unconditionally on his terms. And really it's the unconditional surrender of the enemy to a perfectly good and merciful and loving God. So, but we must remember that all of his commands are in our best interest and are life enhancing and cause us to live a freer and more fulfilling life. But our own sinful nature and the devil's lies will try to deceive us that Jesus' commands are life restricting and will bind us down and not give us happiness, that the happiness that we desire. You imagine if there were no driving laws in South Australia. You try and get home from this place today in your car. There are some idiot going 90 k's an hour on the footpath, another one driving the other way at 60 k. I mean, like, you would stay here forever. You wouldn't venture out there. Freedom. I just want freedom to drive how I want, when I want, how I want. Yeah? You're going to restrict 
your freedom and everyone's else. We need good, wholesome regulation and command so that it enhances all of our freedom. Isn't that right? Yeah. Hey, they've done experiments with, with babies and kindergartens and uh, psychologists have done this research. Interesting. And you can put a kindergarten and if it doesn't have a proper fence around it and if there are roads everywhere, you know, the kids, without being told, will just, just actually, at morning recess or, or lunch, they'll just hang around where the buildings are, just in a space, because zoom, cars, okay? But you can put up a fence right up to a massive freeway, and those kids with gay abandon will just go running up and throw themselves onto the fence, and three or four metres away, there's cars going 100 k's, because they know intuitively that they're freer and can enjoy the space when there are boundaries. You don't give boundaries to kids and they go crazy. They, they, it's life restricting. And so God's laws are all good. They may not be convenient. They may be in your face. <laughs> they may be challenging you, but they're good. They're life enhancing. So not only do we obey his commands, but we must trust his promises. And when we do trust his promises, miracles of answered prayer and amazing provisions by our good and merciful God take place. All the promises of God, they are to be believed, they're to be received, they're to cause us to throw ourselves upon Jesus and say, Lord, what you did 2,000 years ago, you can do today. You can save my soul, you can heal my body, you can deliver me, deliver me from this demon, you can provide for me this miracle of finance, you can resolve this, this relational problem promises to be believed, challenging our faith to reach out to him. The Jesus who did those things 2,000 years ago, he can do them today. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. We have commands to be obeyed. We have promises to be believed. So what are you believing for today? Just on this one. What are you believing for right now? Is there a promise that's ringing in your heart or, or there's a need that you have? You get hold of a promise from Jesus. Inject it into your heart. Start to believe it. Meditate on it. Let it become the foundation for your thinking, your speaking, your believing, and I guarantee you'll become a lightning rod for the grace and power of God to actually provide for you. True. It's true. There is no such thing as real biblical faith without its two dimensions of obedience and faith. Like a coin has no identity without its two sides. You ever seen a one-sided coin? No, no such thing. So you can't talk about biblical faith, say, oh, it's all about the promises, oh, all the best stuff, all the good stuff. It's also about the commands. So if we're to walk as I walk, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. He goes on now to say, love as I love. There's so much I can say. I'm just going to say a few comments about love and then we're going to wrap up in prayer. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Then he goes on to say, look, if you hate your brother, well, you're not a Christian, basically. Oh, if you're full of hatred and resentment and bitterness... Because it's the antithesis of, of the gospel. Because you, it, it's really an evidence that you're not really born again. If you're full of hatred and full of resentment and full of bitterness and full of retribution, he goes, you really can't be a Christian, not a practicing Christian. You can say that you're a Christian in your head, but in your heart, because if, if, if you really have come to know the, the Jesus of love, then there's no room in your heart and that gradually he'll unloose those things from you. It might take a bit of time, but your conscious is saying, I need help. I need to get rebuilt on the inside. I need to let go of a lot of the stuff that's holding me back. So this kind of loving is the beautiful unifying force and the great identifying mark of an authentic Christian community. The love that John is referring to is the love that was revealed on the cross by Jesus. And folks, it's a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a giving type of love. It reaches beyond our family and friends. It reaches even to our enemies and to really difficult people, disagreeable people, 
and downright objectionable people. Man, I came across somebody who was just downright ornery when I was in Sri Lanka. Really difficult. Just, oh, they come that way, I want to go this way. All the time, argumentative and picking and I'm thinking, oh, I'm saying, Jesus, take him away from me, please. I don't need this now. I'm just trying to preach. And but they kept on coming to me, so the Lord didn't hear my prayer. <laughs> See, I just did not like them, but I had to love them. People say, oh, well, if you don't like somebody, it means you're not a Christian. Well, that's ridiculous. So there's some, some people you just don't like. There's some things that people do that are quite objectionable. But you're not allowed to hate them. You're not allowed to want to pay back and to be... You've, otherwise, we're just like non-Christians. Even those who are objectionable, we need to be reaching out to. And it's how we reach out to them with the love of Christ in our hearts. You don't have to agree with them. Even people who are most disagreeable, <laughs> you can agree to disagree agreeably with them. They might be disagreeable, but you'd be agreeable. And, and so, um, Jesus dealt with them all in, in Palestine for three and a half years. You read the Gospels. I mean, some people, how he didn't give them a knuckle sandwich beats me. <laughs> like, it just was, they were really difficult, obnoxious, nasty pieces of work. And he never compromised, he told it straight, but he never hated them. He could tell the truth, but with a spirit of love. And, and when, they, when they did it truthfully and lovingly, it drove him crazy. They wanted to kill him. Because better to have somebody hate you and get a stick and hit you than somebody to speak the truth, but to do it in a loving way that respected you. That just pointed out their own sin and their own darkness, and it drove them crazy. Their hypocrisy came to the fore. Amazing. On the cross, Jesus was still loving on people, <laughs> even though his feelings would have been not feelings of love and warmth and tenderness towards anyone. His pain would have been racking through his body. The suffering was so intense, the evil that he was experiencing at the hands of brutal executioners. We can scarcely take it in that in this state, he forgave his murderers. As he's gazing down from the cross, he's thinking of his mum, he's thinking of John, he's thinking of, and, and, and he's even those brutal men who were torturers and just doing diabolical things. He could even find something in their favour. You know what it was? Ignorance. A father. They're just stupid. They're just dumb. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He's choosing to love in spite of his feelings. He's choosing to do the right thing, even though everything in himself was in such pain and such difficulty, particularly as he's getting separated from his father, the father of love, as he becomes sin and the father has to turn from him. And there's a centurion. He's the head of the execution party. There's a thief who's probably killed people and robbed them next to him. And they receive mercy. He actually is thinking of them and, and they receive mercy as they respond to his love being demonstrated. I think Jesus could see the centurion's kind of something was happening in his heart. I think he could read the body language. And I, it doesn't say it in scripture, but I reckon he would have prayed a prayer. Father, he's close. The thief. He confessed. The, the centurion confessed after Jesus died. But, but he's thinking of people who are dark. Really dark. You can't love like this unless you have experienced Jesus' love for yourself. And you can't... Be, you're not able to love like this unless you've received the Holy Spirit of love in your life. Because he sheds the love of God in our heart. He, you know, Romans 5.5, 5, the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God in our hearts so that we're able to rise above our, our, our restricting humanity and our sinful nature. 
how we can love the most objectionable person. You don't have to agree with them, but you can reach out to them and be kind and merciful towards them. You cannot grow spiritually while you hate other people or hold on to bitterness and resentment towards those who have offended you. If you are an offence machine and you're going to be offended this week, as sure as night follows day, by somebody, probably somebody in your family is going to offend you because usually the people that you love the most are the ones that can hurt you the most. Like the Queen says, that, you know, where there's great love, there's also great pain and great hurt. So someone's going to say the wrong thing. Someone's going to do the wrong thing. Are you an offence machine where you're a lightning rod for all those offences and you accumulate them? You accumulate them after a three or four month period and it's going to do you in. It's going to separate you from God. It's going to hurt you. It's going to make you physically sick. It's going to make you psychologically twisted. You're going to wreck relationships. You can't hold on to bitterness and hate and resentment. Jesus forgave when he's on the cross and it was a choice and it wasn't based on how he was personally feeling. And Christian love is not a feeling. It ain't a feeling. It has nothing to do with feelings. It's a choice. It's an act of your will that you choose to love others. And when you do that by faith, when you faith it, you will make it. You don't fake it till you make it. You faith it till you make it. Then he provides the way by which you can express love the right way. And, and, and so, amazing how the Lord did this. Just amazing. Thrilling. There will always be people that we will dislike or that are irritating or are competitors or are enemies. Always there'll be those people. But with Christ in our lives and with his limitless love working in us, we can break free of attitudes that build walls between people and instead to start building bridges towards people. And there's a huge amount of incivility within our society today. Church, it's true. Huge amount of incivility. And we've got to be part of the answer. I mean, you take that innocent debate over the beer. What's his name? Cooper's. Cooper's beer. Christian beer. Christians founded that firm. <laughs> Isn't that right? That's the only one that Christians can drink? Cooper's? <laughs> so Andrew Hastie, born again Christian from Western Australia. Beautiful man. Ex-Navy SAS man. You know, you wouldn't want to mess with him. Tim Wilson, beautiful man. Practicing homosexual wants to, to, to marry his partner, is for, he's part of the Liberal Party, very conservative and everything else, and they're best of buddies, the two of them. They love each other. And they have this debate over a beer. It's just a... And you know, they succinctly, you ought to see it, they succinctly state the argument. I thought, that's actually pretty profound. Tim Wilson is a brilliant man. I mean, I love him as a person. And uh, he, he's brilliant in, in his understanding of freedom of expression and religion and, and, and worship and speech and all that stuff. He's a practicing homosexual, he wants to marry his partner. And there's Andrew Hastie, born again Christian, who's totally opposed to gay marriage. And they're having a civil discussion and they present their argument and get what? They actually give the argument from the other perspective. So they actually are able to, to walk in the other's shoe. Oh, Tim, this is what you really mean. Oh, Andrew, this is what you really mean. And at the end, they agree to disagree agreeably and have a beer together. Well, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. How can you do that? You've got to hate your, the people that you have differences with. Jesus says, love your enemies. And that means loving people that think differently to us, believe differently to us, and behave differently to us. How different. So it doesn't mean to say you don't have a, a, a value base or beliefs, but in a civil society, if Australia, seriously not being a, a terrible prophet here, if Australia takes on board civil incivility where we end up hating different groups who have different beliefs, it's just one step, one more step that that can actually become acts of violence and civil strife, like I've just come from Korea, from, uh, from Sri Lanka, where the Sinhalese and the Tamils, such hatred towards each other that it ended up with 130,000 of them killed mercilessly. Terrible stuff. 
And so this is really important. So there's an application for our society. Hey, listen, we've got to be part of the answer. Wherever we are, school, work, university, be civil, be strong, be loving, be like Christ. Love as Jesus would love. Can you say amen to that? Hey, it's true. Oh, I'd love to say so much more from 1 John 2, but we can't. Let's stand together.